Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. I'm here today with Alina Furman. She is the founder and CEO of Call Me, a wellness brand focused on babies and children whose mission it is to demystify and educate families about the importance of regular massage practice. The reason why I'm bringing Alina on today is because while I have had a number of female entrepreneurs on as guests, I haven't really had the opportunity to talk about what it's like to be a mother and an entrepreneur, um, but even more so, she went through postpartum depression, which I think is probably a lot more common than uh, a lot of people realize, especially men who never have to go through it. So uh, I thought this would be a good opportunity to not just give uh, male entrepreneurs an opportunity to better understand uh, what their spouses might be going through or their business partners, um, but also for female entrepreneurs to realize that, you know, you're not alone and other people are also probably going through it too. So uh, why don't you tell everyone a little bit more about Call Me and uh, your journey to getting there and we'll go from there. When I decided to launch Call Me, um, this was already after a series of other businesses that I had um, launched and scaled for some people. And then also this is my first product-based business on my own. But uh, when I did have my kids about 15, 14 years ago, my kids are 10 and 14 now, I it was really hard to figure out. I was an author. I had already published 20 books from mainstream publishers. I was, you know, on the all the morning shows and doing I was pretty successful already. But then when I had kids, I felt like kind of my life had um, I, it stopped in a way and also began. And there was this weird period of transition where all of a sudden you're just um, responsible for another being. And I was still working full time and doing um, other projects. And it was really super hard. And I always you know, think back to that time. And I really would never have been able to launch anything at, um, while going through that initial period because, you know, my, my baby was my launch and there was so much to get adjusted to. So I had to kind of scale back my career at that point. And even though I had launched other businesses, I could never really, um, I always felt that I would have to compromise or have a partner or somehow scale, uh, create a business that was a more service based or, um, and I could never grow to the extent that I would really want to, if I was like a male or a single female and I could work kind of just like nonstop. Um, so I really always tempered my ambitions because I had to, and I had to balance it with having two kids. Was your expectation of motherhood the reality or or was there a gap and what was that gap? When I was pregnant, I thought it was going to be super easy to manage everything. I was like, well, I'm going to be working at home and I'm going to be um, taking care of my baby and everything's going to be working out perfectly and just he's going to sleep and, and a schedule and none of that happened. Um, I did, you know, when I did have my first son, I was working at the hospital and like the day, that day, that same day, because I had, uh, I was an editor in chief of a magazine at that time. And I remember just never having that break. And some women have that break because maybe they work for a corporation, but if you're working for your own business, um, you really are like the last you know, stop. And so if there's a situation or a problem, um, you're the one they're, they're, they're going to be going to, and you can't just take a break because you having a baby, like literally having a baby, emailing and texting. And so this kind of became, you know, how I did everything. I was feeding the baby. I was writing emails and it was, and women do it every day and they are having small babies and, and running their businesses. And honestly, um, I couldn't imagine, and I know many of them and I work with many of them, um, and they're scaling their businesses. And, um, unless really you have some help, it's just, I, I'm, I don't know how they're doing it, honestly, because it's just all in and you're like, wow. And the shock of it, the shock of having a baby of all of a sudden not having your schedule, um, being so out of control. I think, I think as you know, a type a person and an ambitious person, and you know, I'm sure all the 
uh, guys and women out there who are like that can identify, you know, you're used to just like, oh, okay, you're your own, you know, obstacle. So you're the only obstacle. Like if, if you have enough energy, you can work all day. And I used to do that, but then all of a sudden you have no control over anything in your life. And you don't know when your baby's going to wake up. You don't know when they're going to need you. You don't have any, um, control over your schedule anymore. You are at the beck and call of another human, um, basically all, every single minute of your day and your nights as well. So it's just like, it's almost like all of a sudden I found myself in this, like, um, you know, when you're in Vegas and you have no idea what time it is, um, it could be night, it could be day. Like, you're just like, I am like my whole reality has shifted and I'm in this other universe and it's completely different than what I thought it was going to be. Did you have any support? Like, did you have your parents nearby or siblings or anyone that could help you or? So my sister, she always, you know, we laugh. She's a year older than me and she always, you know, never wanted kids. And so, you know, she's like, thank God you did. And so she was not involved because she just, you know, we weren't like, oh, we love babies. We weren't like that kind of uh, people at the time. And um, so she just kind of ran when she saw like, and my son had colic and he had, um, he was crying all the time. So she was like, this is not for me. I'm so glad I don't have kids. So that was it. And she's still like that. So she, when she comes over and she's exactly the same, um, uh, my mom was living close by and, uh, but she was working full time. So, um, what I did, uh, have, and my husband had left after, uh, after a week at home. And I was like, where are you going? Like, don't leave me alone with this baby. You know, I have to work and, and have this baby. And like, I'm like, are you serious? Like, how am I supposed to do this? But because he had to work in an office, he had to leave. He got to leave. And I was very jealous and mad at him. And, um, and then my mom, finally, I started, uh, I launched a, a startup. Um, one of my startups was, a. Uh, Lego, Lego subscription company. And it was, my partner was in Silicon Valley at the time. And it was, I was more like kind of all in and one and a half. He was, my son was one and a half at the time. And I'm like, I can't do this unless you, my mom had to quit her job and come and help me because I was never going to be able to scale that business unless she had done that. You say that you experienced postpartum depression. What exactly does that mean, what does that feel like? And when did you come to understand that that's what you were experiencing? People say postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety. And I had probably, you know, I had a lot of different emotions all the time. Um, like go from crying and to happy, to elated, to like, oh, I'm so, you know, and I think that's because your hormones as a woman are just so out of whack. You literally just, you know, like produced, you know, it's a science experiment. Like you made another life. Like I, you still are like, what is that? Like hide Like I'm not, it, it wasn't like natural. Like it, it felt like almost sci-fi, you know, um, that I had this person and I produced it. So, so it, so for me, it was more just about like, I, and I wasn't sleeping. So that's the other thing. So I don't, I mean, everyone says postpartum depression, anxiety. Um, when you're not, when you're sleeping in two, three hour increments, that's a, um, form of war torture, um, that people use still to this day, uh, sleep deprivation is a very common, uh, form of, uh, torture. And, um, it's just, it's just that simple. And, um, and so people put a lot of labels on it and it's like, well, give me any guy who is like, or, you know, who can do that for seven months or eight months straight where you're up every three hours, uh, for whatever reason, and you have no idea when you can go back to bed. Or if you do go fall asleep for like 10 minutes, then you're woken up again in another, you don't know if you're going to sleep for three hours or, you know, uh, 30 minutes. Um, so, so yeah, so it was a common combination of like, um, just not functioning well in those kinds of insane conditions that we just take for granted. And, you know, and, and until you go through, go through it, you kind of don't believe people like your people told me like, it's hard. I'm like, Oh, it's just, they're not, they don't know their baby's difficult or, you know, it's there. It's, it's not going to be like that for me, but until you go through the hormones, the sleep deprivation, the balancing the work with the everyday responsibilities, you don't know how you're going to feel. Um, and usually, and I, I think a lot of women just underreport all the things that they go through because, um, 
you know, we, for me, it was like, I was still going, I was still highly functioning. I still had a full-time job, but you know, I was struggling and I just couldn't even realize that because I was like, it was like the uh, frog in the boiling water. Like until you're like at the, like at a point where you're like, I'm just going nuts here. You don't really realize it. Now you said your, your partner was working in an office. Uh, my husband. Yeah. He was, uh, he, yeah, he was, uh, working in a traditional, more traditional setting. But outside of work, he was with you and there and supportive and in it. Well, yeah, but I mean, the evolutionary speaking, you know, we all talk about, you know, one of my big things is like household responsibilities and how to split everything up. But I feel like a little bit women are from an evolutionary standpoint set up to be the main caretaker, unfortunately, because if you're nursing, you know, if you're, if you're half formula feeding, then yes. And that's great. You know, your partner can come in at night and feed the baby, but say, what if you're nursing? Um, so the whole cycle of the biological, um, cycle is set up so that you're the one getting up at night and yes, you can pump milk, but you really have to be up. Um, and you know, unless you have a night nurse there who, who's like just taking the baby from you as soon as you finish feeding them, you know, you have to settle them back to bed. So while my husband tried to be helpful and there were many times where he was up maybe, and I was like, I just can't deal with this right now at like five in the morning. And I'm like, you take this shift. I was the one who was primarily up and dealing with, um, you know, he, I definitely think he got way more long, longer stretches of sleep, but when he would come home, of course, you know, he would take the baby, but because you're nursing the baby, you're always on. So it's like, that's how it's set up that, um, no matter, even now my kids, um, my boys, um, the youngest still prefers me to put him to bed because I'm like the mom and I'm, he's used to that nurturing from me. So it just becomes like by default that you become the, um, the primary caretaker, even though you make an effort to be equitable and, you know, I'm a feminist and I was like, my husband's going to do 50%. It's just, oh, it's very hard to get to that 50% um, when it comes to children. Why was it at one and a half that you felt uh, when, when your son was one and a half? Why, why did you feel at that time it was okay to start the next thing, to start a company? I feel like the first year are just like, you're li literally just surviving. Um, you're, you're just, am I gonna, you're just trying to keep everybody alive and you're like figuring everything out. And then as like the six months, when you hit six months, they become a little more, um, you know, uh, mobile and a little more animated and a real person rather than like just you know, someone you're just caretaking, like a plant that you're feeding and growing every day. And then um, at, a one, at one year, you kind of catch your breath a little bit, I feel. There's like that mark where you made it to one year. Like, and so you begin to, okay, I kind of got this. Like, you know, you, you've also evolved enough to, I also evolved enough to not need to control every single moment of my day and understand how to go with the flow more. Because again, that's the biggest shock is I think um, the lack of control over your schedule. And so when you learn how to deal with emotions and ride those waves of like, okay, I can't answer this email now, but I'll answer it like maybe in three hours or you just begin to be more flowy and fluid and, um, I think you, that's when you start evolving and into a parent. And, uh, because I mean, that's the main thing I see with people who don't have kids like my sister and, and other people is that, that they become very rigid over time because they're used to, okay, this happens at this time I can have a schedule and, and I love schedules, but you just can't do that. So you learn to be less rigid. And that I think ultimately that's what parenthood is fluidity. I have a number of friends and family that have kids and almost universally they're like, kids are great, but I can't remember the last time I slept. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so one of my uh, closest friends, his daughter's just turned two and he took her on holiday and she was screaming and yelling and rolling around on the floor, making a scene. And that was like eight days straight. And he was like, what 
the hell is going on? It's like, welcome to the terrible twos. It's intense. It's intense because, yeah, you just, again, you never know what's going to happen. And like, how do you plan a business? How do you, you know, have goals? Uh, like, what, like, you know, you, when you have a business, you're thinking about it, like, you know, kind of 24 seven, like it's always in the back of your mind, you're planning, you're strategizing. When you have a baby, all of a sudden, it's like, and your mom, and I, again, I have to say, you know, there's the, the guy, the, the men who it's hard for them because they feel, you know, guilty as well, because they want to be with their kids or, but, you know, with women, it's like, you're literally thinking about your kid like 24 hours a day too, because, so you have to somehow figure out how to have those two parallels going at the same time. And it's just, you don't have the brain, the brain width to really make that happen. So I, I know when I was young, there was like mommy and me, there's things like after, birth that you could do to kind of facilitate bonding and and these kinds of things do you feel like there was any kind of support before giving birth enough that would help you to understand just how difficult it was going to be i never had that because my mom like she blocked it all out because i'm sure she was traumatized from all of, all our early years and then my sister never had kids so i never grew up where in a household where I held a baby or prepared for that in any way. I didn't even notice babies. Honestly, I was just like, oh, oh, that's 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 someone. So I never had that support and never had that education. And I should have read a book, I think. But I was so smug thinking that I was going to be like this such a you know expert mother for some reason it was all going to come naturally to me because that's the messaging that a lot of parents get that you know women are somehow more equipped to be nurturing and raise kids and um and i just thought it came naturally and i i had no idea and i was just like when i had it i should have been more prepared but at the hospital as well you know i don't i remember like they just gave me the baby and they're like okay here and i'm like what do you mean you know like well, well, why? No, I'm like, don't leave. And then, um, so yeah, I was just, no, I was not prepared. And then I was, as a result, I had a, but I don't think you could ever be prepared because I talked to, uh, practitioners, uh, NICU nurses, um, doctors every day who delivered, you know, babies and, um, doulas. They said that as soon they thought they knew what they, what they were doing with babies and then nothing prepares you for your having your own. I, have not had my own. Uh, consider this research for me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was married at one point. We never got far enough to consider kids. But I'm at this weird, so I'm 36, and I'm at this weird stage in my life where, like, I'd like to have a family. I'd like to give it another shot. But I also see everyone around me absolutely miserable and I know how much I love my sleep and my freedom to travel. And that really concerns me that like, I'm gonna lose all of that. One of my last books was called Kiss and Run. And it was the first book about women's female, female commitment phobia. And I was wrote that because um, one, you know, people talk about women as always wanting to have babies and marriage and, and you know, now that's changing. Uh, but that was, you know, I wrote my book in 2007. And I was terrified, I'm terrified of having children and getting married. And I mean, I was more terrified of getting married. I don't know why, because I also come from, you know, a divorced family, but, um, but I just, I was so terrified of commitment. And, and I think that's, that's fair. Like, that's true. Like you would be like people, you would be giving up all those things. And, you know, and everyone assumes that everyone should have children. And that's just not the case. And, um, and it's important. It's a very hard decision. It's a very personal decision. And it's never a decision that you can have all the information in the world and still, you know, not know whether you want to have kids uh, or not. Um, it's very hard. It's, and, and I just feel like sometimes used to be more so we're just, we have this whole culture of everyone has to have babies and everyone has like four or five. And I just, and it's just so much pressure. You, you know, you feel some pressure and you don't know if it's you who's pressuring yourself or society or the cultural norms that you're reacting to. So it's very hard to know what you really want. 
I think it's hardest because we are also evolutionarily speaking, biologically programmed to exist purposely for, or specifically for the purpose of procreation, just to keep the species going. And so in a modern society, we're not only fighting against what we want or may not want, we're fighting against our biological programming as well as religion, um, which is like the biggest driver of, I think a lot of it, Western organized religion. Um, so yeah, I think some people get stuck. Um, and and I, I've heard that, so my background's in psychology. I've heard that, and I, I've kind of studied some instances of this where, as you alluded to, when you have a child, your thoughts are on the child all day long, which means, from what I understand, that you stop really thinking about your partner and that makes the relationship kind of fall apart in some instances, a lot of instances, at least half of them, I would say, because of the fact that where before you were focused on each other, you're now focused on the kids, you don't really have time or energy for each other, and so things fall apart. And that's another reason why I'm afraid of kids, because if I'm marrying someone, it's because I want to be with them. And, and I think some people think that kids will save that flagging marriage where like probably not a lot of couples struggle with um you know being intimate and having time for each other and even liking each other after they have kids um and you know but it's interesting so it depends on how what for what almost like why why are you going into the relationship when i met my husband i was just coming off um I'm really, I was living in the city. I was like a dating expert. I was very commitment phobic. And, um, and when I met him, I was like, wow, you know, for some reason, like, I'm like, he, he would make like the perfect partner to have a family with. So like, he wasn't the necessarily, he, I was, you know, he was great and I was attracted to him, but he wasn't necessarily the guy, like the guys I was picking at the time who maybe I would love to travel with the rest of my life. You know what I mean? He wasn't that guy. He was the guy who I would like to have a family with. So I guess it was also like, that you make different choices uh, when you're all of a sudden, and I didn't even know that I was thinking about everything because having a, ba a family at some point, but I realized like I was getting tired of maybe being on the scene. Um, and so when I met him, he just that energy that he had was very different than the other types of people I would naturally be attracted to. So it didn't impact us that much because I had already chosen him because I knew he would be a good partner for family having a family with but then he left you all alone at home that man him. <laughs> i was fortunate because a lot of my businesses i was able to not make an you know you know you don't always pulling an income right away and so he someone had to be you know making a bigger income at the time and there were other times when i was making a very big income um during our marriage so but him being a stable you know source of income and having to go off and do that um was gave me more freedom when it came to then having all my other businesses um and so it's it's one of those catch 22s too that you know someone has to go and be the stable provider too if you could go back and do it again what would you change i would love to have um prepared myself a little more in the beginning, like, and set up more, um, support networks from the beginning, because I really thought I could do everything myself. I could work full time at home, take care of a baby and not, and be sane. And that's, you know, is not always the case. So I would have set up, I would have demanded more help. Um, and somehow figured it out. I think things are different now where there's social media, there's uh, meetup.com. I think there's, I could be wrong, but I know just as a single guy traveling around, whenever I go to different places, I see different groups, different kinds of social groups. And often there's like mom yoga and, you know, like mom breakfast, bring your baby. 
there's like also it seems like wherever I go around the world, there's these kinds of groups coming up for for moms to be able to have a support network. It's very important to maintain friendships, and I always uh, encourage people to you know make friends um, with other. Uh, and just maintain their friendships. But it's another thing to have like a built-in support network of of like someone who's going to take your baby um, and let you work for three, four hours so you can concentrate. Um, or, you know, I mean, having a runway, you know, you take advantage. I mean, take for granted that you might have eight hours of work runway every day. Like my husband goes to work and he sometimes he has his own business, so he can be at home too. But he has eight clean hours of unpolluted time. And even though my kids are 10 and 14 now, you know, I still have all my days are like, okay, you have set up your appointments and you have to make sure that the teachers are communicated with and this and that and pickups. And so I don't, I maybe now that they're older, I have five hours of runway of work runway a day, but that's not a lot when you're scaling a business, when you're doing a launch. Um, and when it comes to mom friends, I, it was very hard for me because I was actually writing a book about mom friends and it's very hard to just meet new people when you're like, Oh, I have a baby. You have a baby. Let's be best friends. And so I actually, you know, it was hard for me with mom friends and mom groups. And, and, and I just didn't like that making friends based on the fact that we all have a uterus, you know, I'm like, that's, that's great. But I'm like, you know, we, I, we have to have more things in common than, and I just can't talk about babies. I still can't talk about, I mean, I do this for a living now all day long, but in my personal life, like I, you know, I want, I'll, I, I'll help anyone who needs help, but please let's not talk about the children, you know, like all day. <laughs> Cause my identity is so much more like, I feel like it's so important to maintain your identity. That was the big thing is I just felt when I had my baby, like my identity was like, and I know a lot of mothers struggle with that. My identity as a person out in the world, ambitious, successful was just all stripped for me in a way. I think everyone does that. They build up this identity for themselves and it's usually about their work and like, that's who they are. And I, I think that may be an American problem where it's like, who are you? I'm an entrepreneur. Who are you? I'm, I'm the CEO. It's like, okay, but you only work some of the day who are you the rest of that day uh i don't know oh yeah we associate with our work like in the in the u.s so much more um than in other cultures i've enjoyed traveling and living in other places because i get to see that for example in portugal they don't really work that much and for for them you know their happiness is a beer or a wine or coffee at the kiosk next to the park, watching their kids play. They don't like when, and, and in fact, it's actually now illegal in Portugal to receive messages from your coworkers or your bosses when you're not working. I think that's amazing. And I think work-life balance is just something we're beginning to talk about and, you know, and just beginning to kind of like improve on a bit and i think it took the pandemic and a lot of parents and people just saying this is not sustainable to like not to, to work like we and pretend we don't have kids you know like you have to work like you don't have kids and 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 parent like you don't have to work you know and that's not sustainable and and i think now the conversations about you know mental health and all parents and dealing and and if you're you know if you have to have your kid on a zoom that's more normal, but that was never the case before. Um, and people are just beginning to really accept the realities of modern parenthood. Um, but balance is, you know, so elusive here. What are the things that you talk about within your, your business? It's all informed by the fact that I had such a hard time in the beginning and I wish I had been taught certain things. Uh, being from Ukraine, I was born in Kiev, Ukraine. Um, I never mentioned that before, but um, I moved to the US when I was seven. I always um, see things from different points of view. So when I started like looking at being a baby products expert, I started looking into different modalities uh, from other cultures and you know, baby massage and all these holistic practices 
are are some are very easily adopted in Europe and other places. But here we're very slow in the West to adopt uh, different modalities and um, more integrative types of uh, practices. And um, I just started really started really doing this education online and showing people this is something that's so important and there's a lot of science behind it and it just started growing um and then i have a product that's associated with baby massage that's the first of its kind and it's um patented and um now that's my main uh product and i'm just building out a product lineup all around holistic wellness so you can so i wanted to create a better more um calming environment for the family because there's so much distraction and there's so much stress between working and taking care of your baby. You know, baby massage is that one time you have to really connect with the baby and yourself and really focus on mental health and wellness for both parents and the baby and the children. Um, even though, you know, I always say in the, in the world of anxiety, you know, we need to connect with each other more than ever. It's, weird for me that people need to be educated that they should be massaging their baby it just seems like something so natural for me to like want to do it's like oh like for example i was just taking my dog out the other day uh this morning yeah he was really freaked out by fireworks the other night he's never had a problem in the past he's almost eight years old today he refused to go to that side of the neighborhood he stopped he like he let me pull on his neck like so hard because he was just like, no, I'm not going to go anywhere. To a point where I was like, okay, well, let me like get down face level. Let me look him in the eye. Let me try to soothe him, tell him it's, everything's fine. Even though he's a dog, you know, it's a, a little bit more difficult to, to reason um, without that, that communicative ability. And I just kind of put my arm around him and I'm like, dude, you're fine. Everything's fine. There's no fireworks. But like I was petting him, like we we know intuitively when our pets are yeah. stre under stress, we massage them, we pet them. I think there was a statistic: sixty percent of parents didn't know that ba uh, baby massage helps with also brain development and other uh, development, social, emotional. And in our culture, no one taught me, you know, at the hospital that you should massage your baby. You have so much ability to calm yourself, calm the baby and even your pet. So now there's your dog, there's all these new products. Now baby, a uh, pet massage and is a huge thing as well. And it's actually, there's a, when I had my dog, there was something called the Tellington touch and we would do little massages on, uh, cause my dogs are all anxious. Cause I think I'm an anxious person. And I think in general, like we convey our anxiety to our children. So when what's wonderful about massage and connecting with your pet or your baby or child um, is that you are forced to calm yourself first and through massaging them, you are also uh, releasing oxytocin within them and then also within yourself. So it's the one practice that is as good for the giver as it is for the person getting it. And so that's why I always say, you know, it's just one of those we're all like especially you know um working moms or any mom who's just for the first time doing this and they're all anxious um it's important to calm yourself and, and realize it's part of your practice as well as their practice of you know connecting and calming yourself and then um really creating a strong bond now is this something that your mother did with you or did you see her doing it with your kids when they were really young that kind of was like oh hey, we should be actually thinking about this more. No, I mean, even though in Ukraine and, um, and in the Soviet region, um, actually massage is something that is really recommended from birth and everybody there is like, oh, okay, everybody massages their kids. Um, and yes, I think that we, I had remember having some massage, uh, but it wasn't uh, until it really hit me when I started, uh, I went online, I started seeing all these videos of babies being massaged in Asia and other Eastern uh, India. Um, and I was like, wow, look at these babies, they're all being massaged. And I started researching how important massage is. And, and that's when I started, I had a resurgence and I'm like, and my son, the oldest son now has clinical anxiety and he's just a high strung kid. And I wondered like, what if I had massaged him when he was younger? Like, what if I had, instead of just, you know, like just cried along with him, massaged him. And we would have both been like, 
much better at that time would he have had anxiety today and so i'm just looking back i'm like i wish someone would have taught me baby massage in the hospital and that's you know we're a mission-based business because our goal is all about education and while we have a baby massager and it's a really cool gadget um it's really about education and um teaching parents and getting into those hospital programs early on so we can really teach them you were mentioning that your son has uh, clinical anxiety. Is that the 10 year old or the 14 year old? 14. So my father started teaching me how to meditate when I was 18. I think at 14, it might be good. And that, that might be something it, it's been life changing for me. I, I never had anxiety. I have, I have ADD. And so it, it was really difficult for me to focus and, and manage my daily existence. And I was pushed onto pills by doctors for a very long time. And finally, I said, you know, at, at the age of 18, I'm done. I'm, I refuse to take it one more time. And I'm going to just find another way to do it. And my dad said, look, I learned how to meditate when I was 18. And it was life changing for me. So since you're so insistent on not, you know, remaining on these pills, like don't blame you whatsoever. So I'm going to teach you how to meditate. And you taught me. And I've been doing it for 19 years now. That's such a gift. And, and that's another, um, so I'm, uh, definitely moving into the category of, uh, uh, meditation devices for kids as well. So, because, you know, it's not just babies that need massage, but it's also, it's calm is all about that state of calm teaching mental health and mental wellness and meditation to kids and, um, setting up those, uh, those behaviors early on. So then, so then eventually they have all the tools they need. So we do a lot of breathing. I do a lot of breathing with the kids and when they have big emotions, which is a lot. Um, and then we do, um, so yeah, so my next, uh, one of my next products is a, actually a medit a breathing uh, meditation device for um, older kids and toddlers and, and uh, you know, just so you can teach them that mindfulness early on, that piece. I think one of the reasons why you know, your children's generation has so many issues in that regard is probably because they were raised around so much tech. And parents are distracted. So it's like, we we look at our kids and my husband's all like, oh, they have too much screen time. And I'm like, screen time, like you've been on your phone, staring at your phone for the past, you know, nine hours. I'm like, so this is the new reality. And as much, I fought it for so long when they were younger and I, I kept them off as much as I could to the, to my own detriment, because I would have to play games with them, which is like trains and like, oh my gosh. And you know, you're like, I have so many deadlines and I'm playing trains and like, and that's, that's the day of your life. But you know, I tried, but then after a certain point, you're like, wow, you know, this is a Pandora's box. At some point you just give up because you're like, as long as they're doing what they need to do, you know, you can't fight all the time and create and with your kids about screen time, but the parents are distracted. That's the other thing you're raising your child. I'm on my phone. I'm nursing him. I'm answering emails. So like right away, our family lives are so fractured, you know, in a way that maybe they weren't as before. And yes, I mean, our parents ignored us for many reasons because that was the, you know, parents always in the seventies and eighties, you know, nobody knew you had to spend all your days staring at your kids and telling them what to do. And we had a lot of benign neglect, which was great, you know, because because I think we need more of that. Um, but now everyone's so hyper parenting and like they're on their kids, yet the kids are always on screens and we're always on screens. So it's like this cauldron of anxiety that this, the family is part of. Um, so anything, so that's why I just wanted to start Call Me as the first family wellness brand um, designed to bring calm and connection to the family because, you know, we're all missing it. We're all suffering from this collective anxiety right now. And it's crazy. I think there's nothing wrong with benign neglect. No, it's great. <laughs> Only because your kid learns to become independent. My last book was like, um, I wanted to be at the writing, how to parent like you're, like the seventies, like you're living in the seventies because that, that, I mean, we remember those golden age, you know, that golden age where you didn't worry about every little thing and there wasn't like a million organic, you know, um, or dangers that you perceive as more dangerous than they are. And, and just parents are just 
so much more stress because of all the information that they receive uh, and the barrage of conflicting information. Everybody's like, the, mo the everyone's stressed. What would be your most important piece of advice for people think, either people thinking about having kids or people who've just had kids? Make sure you have your support network uh, set up before the baby comes in a way. So whether it's um, getting help from friends, uh, family, or, uh, or bringing in outside help, you really need more help than you think you do. So set up those systems early on. Um, also try to uh, streamline all the other uh, aspects of your life that you can. So whether, you know, I haven't been to a grocery store in like 20 years. Um, you know, like I cannot, there's no ROI in grocery shopping for me, you know, so I just have like, you know, my delivery services, I have my, everything is, you know, whether it's your auto automate as much as possible. So whether it's your bills, your shopping, anything you can do to outsource, outsource it and uh, just simplify your life to the most basic essentials if you're launching it, whether it's your business, so it's your business and your children and your partner. Um, make time for your partner as well. And remember that, you know, your marriage is the, your marriage is the, um, is the foundation for your family life and your mental health is also super important for it because it's the foundation for everything else. So um, also just be aware that when, you know, when things are getting too much, be aware of uh, asking for help and make sure you do ask for help. And because we tend to want to take everything on as, um, as women, as entrepreneurs, and we think we can do everything. And I, it's the same issue I have with my businesses. I never delegate. So delegate as much as you can. Um, and just learn to be more successful at delegation. I, that's the big one. How can people follow up? People can find me at callme.com. It's K-A-H-L-M-I.com and at get call me on uh, social media if they want more information. And um, just happy to impart some uh, of my hard won wisdom when it comes to parenting and business. All right. Thank you very much, Alina. I appreciate your time and your energy. Don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day. And if you're expecting to have a child soon, your life is about to get a lot harder, but that doesn't mean that you're alone and that you can't rely on other people to help you get through it so that you can take care of your family, yourself, and your business.